Okay, so today we are going to proceed starting with cellular level of organization. I would like to remind you that last time during the introduction we said that there are levels of structural organization. So we'll start with the cell. It starts actually with the chemi chemistry, with the chemicals like atoms, molecules, and then they will form the cell, and cells form tissues, tissues form organs, and then systems, and then the whole body. So we're going to spend two lectures on the cell, and then we, next week also we are going to spend it on two lectures on tissues, and then after that we will go higher up into uh, organs and systems. These are the objectives of the lecture. I received a lot of emails from many students saying, so what, what do we do with these objectives? Is there any relation between the due date of the lecture and the objective? No. The objective is to tell you what is the goal of this lecture. You are not required, even if the objective is in the form of a question, you are not required to answer the question. And the due date for the lecture doesn't mean that you have to take any action. It's just to show you that the lecture is today, it appears on the calendar, especially for the students who are taking the lecture online. Uh, they don't have the schedule uh, appearing in their weekly timetable. So that's why this will provide a reminder for them that there is a lecture today and they have to take it. But no action needs to be taken about the due date of a lecture, okay? And no action needs to be taken about the objectives. It's just give you what are you going to study, what is the goal of this lecture. So cytology is the study of cell, like cytology, and then we have histology is the study of tissue. Cytology is the study of cell, structure, and function, and this is very important, especially from the diagnostic point of view. Uh, cells are studied using microscopes, either light microscope or electron microscopy, and uh, cells can give an idea about like diseases, uh, or they can be used for screening for cancers. Like, for example, these are squamous cells that are uh, derived uh, from pap smear of to detect cervical cancer. So uh, this is the importance of cytology. It is the study of cell. Of course, we're not going to study the abnormal cell. Uh, we only deal with the normal. So the cell, as we mentioned, the normal cell is the basic living structural and functional unit of the body. And the cell provides compartmentalization. That's to say because there are a lot of chemical reactions taking place inside the cell, so they need to be, uh, to be separated from each other and at the same time they need to be synchronized. So the cell provides that. Uh, the cell has a cell membrane, a barrier that controls the inflow and outflow between the cell and the outside and also contains genetic material so that it replicates uh, itself. Of course, this is a, just a, an imaginary cell. There's no cell like this containing all these uh, subcellular structures or organelles or modifications of uh, cell membrane. So it is just a hypothetical, uh, typical cell. The cell consists of plasma membrane or cell membrane, as I mentioned, and we will see that this is very flexible, it's like water, but it's a sturdy membrane and provides a very good barrier for the cell and at the same time controls the exchange. And inside the cell, there is the cytoplasm, which contains subcellular structures, which are the subjects of our lecture next time. This lecture will concentrate on the cell membrane and you will see that in addition to that, these organelles, they are also floating in, on, in, in like a sap of water, uh, which is present in the uh, cytoplasm and it's called the cytosol. And there is the nucleus. Some textbooks consider the nucleus as part of the organelles. Some do not consider it as such. And it contains the genetic material the, the, that I said this is one of the functions of the cell, that it contains genetic information. In fact, it contains most but not all genetic material, and we will see why most, not all. We will see that next time when we study the organelles of the cell. So the plasma membrane is, again, it's a flexible yet sturdy barrier that surrounds and contains the cytoplasm. And as you can see, and probably you have seen this diagram from last lecture, it's, uh, it, it, it's formed when large molecules, macromolecules, chemicals, come together. And so here you find the three macromolecules which constitute the cell membrane, the lipid, the protein, and the carbohydrate. And usually it is described 
in a model which is called the fluid mosaic model. This is the fluid mosaic model. Mainly, uh, the cell membrane is formed of lipids, and the lipids are mainly phospholipids. It's these molecules with the blue head, and these are the tails which contain uh, fatty acids. So the lipids, they are floating in two layers. They float, and they form a bilayer. It's one membrane, but bilayer of molecules of, of lipids. And then we have the uh, proteins. Proteins are usually very large molecules. They are floating in that sea of uh, lipids. Some of them, they are anchored to the membrane. So they are like um, uh, islands. Some of them are just floating on the membrane like iceberg. Some of them, they span the entire thickness of the membrane through and through. And you can see that many of them, they contain pores and uh, channels and act like gatekeepers. So they control the exchange of substances between the fluid inside the cell, which is now we have to call it intracellular fluid. And there's also fluid outside the cell, which is called extracellular fluid, or sometimes it's called the interstitial fluid. So they act as gatekeepers. This is one of their functions, but they have more functions. And then we have the carbohydrates. The carbohydrates, they provide uh, attachment points and they are for protection. I will show you how they uh, attack, I mean, act like attachment points. So the carbohydrates are, are sugars and if you have sugar on your finger, your fingers will get sticky. So it's the same thing here. Cells get sticky and are attached to uh, each other. One of the functions of the carbohydrates uh, that are present, it is not the all the functions, but this is one of the functions. All in all, the plasma membrane, if you imagine yourself as a tiny creature, then uh, when you jump on the plasma membrane, it will give you the feeling uh, of a waterbed rather than a hard surface. So it's all these molecules are floating. They can separate from each other and they can have another piece attached between the points of separation or they, ca they can detach a piece and form a vesicle and so on and they sometimes they allow material to pass in between the molecules all the molecules are floating in the water so it is flexible but it is sturdy membrane these are the functions it's a barrier that separates external from internal again it controls the flow of substances we will see how it controls that and helps to identify the cell. Uh, otherwise, if the cell is misidentified by the immune system, by the defense system of the body, then the defense system is going to attack the cell. So that's why it gives the identity of the cell. And the, here, it's the, the sugars, the, glyco, uh, the glycocalyx is, is important in this identification of the cell. And it's also useful in intercellular signaling, sending messages between one cell and another because in the cell membrane, there are receptors. So when a, when a cell sends a chemical message, then this chemical message finds the corresponding receptor on the other cell, then that's how the communication takes place. So a cell sends a, a chemical message, which is called a ligand, can affect the nearby cells, or it can travel through the blood, like hormones, and affect not all the cells of the body, but only the cells that have the receptor in their cell membrane for that ligand. So the phospholipids, but going back to the content of the formation of the cell membrane, phospholipids are the main types of lipids because they contain phosphate or phosphorus here, and uh, they comprise most of the lipids. And we have two other types of lipids, glycolipids and cholesterol. So glycolipids, as the name indicates, glycoglucose, it means that there is a sugar molecule attached to the lipids. Like for example here, this is the glycolipid where a sugar molecule is attached. We call it glycolipid and constitutes part of the glycocalyx because we have glycoproteins. There are Sugar molecules attached to proteins, so the proteins are called glycoproteins, and glycoproteins and glycolipids together, they form the sugary coat of the cell, like the glaze on the donut. And then we have the cholesterol, another type of lipid. These are molecules that are only present on the inside of the, the lipid bilayer, and they are very important for the strength 
of the cell membrane and making it flexible. So the cholesterol is important for the cell membrane, but excess cholesterol is not good for health. The other uh, proteins, we said that the, um, we have proteins either as integral proteins, and they are firmly embedded in the membrane. Uh, some of the proteins extend through and through. Some of them are just floating. So these have pores that allow substances to pass through them and form channels transmembrane proteins, they we call them, as the name indicates. And then we have some peripheral proteins at the, located at the periphery, either on the outer surface or on the inner surface. And these peripheral proteins, they act like anchorage points. Either they connect the cells to each other, or the ones that are present on the inner surface of the membrane, they allow fibers, protein fibers, from the inside of the cell to be attached to them, and this is important for the shape of the cell. So these are the peripheral proteins. And the glycoproteins, as I said, they are present on the surface of the cell, only the surface, outer surface, outer surface, and uh, they are attached to the sugar to form part of the glycocalyx. This is the glycocalyx that I was talking about, glycoprotein and glycolipid, glycoprotein and glycolipid, and it creates a stickiness, at, it gives the ID, identity of the cell, cell recognition is located here, protects the cell from being digested by enzymes. And the fourth function here is very important as well. It attracts a, a film of fluid. Like when you leave sugar outside in a wet weather, it attracts a film of fluid. So this makes, for example, in some cells like the red blood cells, we will study that in block three, red blood cells, they pass through channels which are called capillaries, and sometimes the capillaries are narrower or they have smaller diameter than the diameter of the red blood cell. So the red blood cell has to fold itself and navigate its way through that vessel. And so it needs a slippery, a slippery surface. This slippery surface is provided by the glycocalyx. Some of the cells are most of the time exposed to the air, like the cells that are lining now my Gas, uh, mouth, esophagus, pharynx, the cells lining my respiratory tree, so they might become dried out if they, if they don't have this glycocalyx, which always attracts the water. So that's it's very important. The proteins, they act as channels, as I mentioned, pores. And sometimes, some of them, some of the molecules are large but, and cannot pass through the channel, through the pore. So that's why some of the proteins, which are called carrier or transporter proteins, they have to change their shape in order to allow these large molecules to enter into the uh, cell. I will talk about this in a moment. Some of the proteins are receptors. Remember the messages between the cells. So proteins act as receptors. They act as enzymes to speed up chemical reactions. And some of them are anchorage points, that I, that, as I mentioned. They anchor either one cell to the nearby cell uh, or to the protein filaments that are present in the cytoplasm. We are going to talk about these filaments next time, and we'll see the importance of these filaments and how they keep the shape of the cell and its processes. And they act as cell identity marker, and this is the function of the glycoproteins in specific. The glycoproteins, they provide a marker. So as I said, that the membrane allows some substances to pass through, prevents others. So it is selectively permeable. Some substances can pass through the lipid bilayer, and these are molecules like oxygen, CO2, uh, water. Small, very small molecules can pass through it, but it is impermeable to large molecules, to ions, the polar molecules, positive or negative molecules or large molecules, they will not be able to pass through the lipid bilayer. And these are the molecules that need proteins to carry them, to transport them. So the selective permeability is established uh, better by the use of the proteins. We can see here how the substances pass through the cells and what is the function of the proteins which are present in the cell membrane. We have two types of transport to start with. We have passive and active. Passive and active in terms of the use of energy. So if there is no energy spent, then it is passive. When there is energy required, then it is active. 
So passive transport, the other name is diffusion. For an, and here, substances, solutes, they pass from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. If they are small, then they can just pass through by simple diffusion through the lipid bilayer, like CO2, like oxygen. They can just pass from higher concentration, so they pass with their concentration gradient, not against concentration gradient. But sometimes you need transport to transport substances against their concentration gradient. I need more sodium here but and more potassium there extracellular, intracellular compartment. So that should be against the concentration gradient and I need to spend energy in order to achieve that. And in this case, uh, this is active transport. It uses ATP molecules. The ATP adenosine triphosphate splits into adenosine diphosphate and phosphate and then it releases the energy and I'm going to use this Bitcoin to spend it in order to um, make the, the change that I want to have. So it's either diffusion through the lipid bilayer, which is for the nonpolar substances, substances that diffuse in lipid, they pass through the lipid bilayer, and others which are a little bit large or they are polar substances that cannot pass through the lipid, they will pass through the protein. And this is another um, thing that to keep in mind. Osmosis is a diffusion. It's the same as diffusion of solutes, but here we use this term when we deal with water. So osmosis in, in, is the passage of water from an area where you have a lot of water. And again, water can pass through the cell membrane, through the, through the lipid bilayer, but most of the water passes through the protein which is present in the lipid, in, in, the, in the cell membrane. And these proteins have a specific name, which is, I think it's, it's easy to memorize. They are called aquaporins. Aqua means water, porins is pore. So they, are, they provide pores for the aqua. So they are aquaporins, special kind of proteins. This should be differentiated from filtration. We are going to mention filtration later on. Filtration is when substances move D driven by the pressure gradient, not concentration gradient. They are pressed. There is a pressure gradient. And this is what happens when, when the blood is filtered in the kidney to form urine. So it's driven by pressure gradient. I'm going to talk about this in details, but I would like you to notice here, for example, this is a glomerulus of the kidney. Blood comes from a blood vessel, afferent, we call it, arteriole, which is, if you compare it with this one, this is narrower, this is wider. So when blood goes into the capillaries here, it is under high pressure because there is a gush of blood coming in and there is only a narrow stream of blood coming out. And so things that are, or the substances that are present in the blood will be squeezed. This is filtration. This is not per, uh, diffusion. Or diffusion could be facilitated. If the molecule is large, and cannot pass through the pore, then the protein will change its shape, accept the molecule from this side, change its shape, and dispose the molecule from the other side. This is what happens, especially in the molecule of glucose. It's a large molecule. So, and, and here, again, there is no, uh, um, no need to spend energy. So it's a kind of diffusion. It's a kind of passive diffusion. It's not active. In active transport, as you can see here, substances, they pass against their concentration gradient. And you will see that, especially in the physiology, when you study the physiology of nerve conduction, that for the nerve to conduct, you need high concentration of intracellular potassium and high concentration of extracellular sodium. As I mentioned, you need a lot of potassium here, a lot of uh, sodium uh, there. And this is only allowed when you have active transport. You have to spend energy for that to allow it. So this is the kind of active transport. And it takes place, as you can see here, again, through the protein, but, but it is not free of charge. And we have another type of transport, which is vesicular transport, when a vesicle, a sac, is formed. And this sac is detached from the cell membrane. Remember, I mentioned that the molecules of the cell membrane are floating. They can be easily separated from each other. A piece of cell membrane can be detached 
without affecting the remaining cell membrane. It will not create a pore because when you take that piece from the cell membrane, the nearby edges will just come back and close together. They are just floating uh, there. So uh, it's very flexible. So these are the vesicles. But this process, all these processes of vesicular transport, they need energy. So they are a kind of active transport, means that they need energy. Is either receptor-mediated endocytosis, taking in, or phagocytosis, or pinocytosis, or uh, transcytosis. So in receptor-mediated endocytosis, there is a receptor on the surface of the cell. The receptor is a protein molecule, which acts as a receptor. A ligand comes, and for example, it's a hormone or any other substance. It goes into the receptor. And then there are some proteins here, which are peripheral proteins called clathrin molecules. The vesicle is formed called clathrin-coated vesicle because the clathrin is going to coat it. And then it is internalized and it's going to be attacked by a vesicle inside the cell, which is called lysosome. It's an organelle. We're going to talk about this later on uh, next time. It contains digestive enzymes. So the digestive enzymes are going to act on the substance that's going, that was internalized in the, in the cell. But the clathrin coat, the receptors, the piece of the cell membrane are all going to be recycled. They will go back and attach themselves as if nothing has happened. And then we have phagocytosis. The difference here in phagocytosis, we have receptors. And these receptors, uh, they are receptors for bacteria, viruses, or uh, worn out cells. Uh, so we have receptors, but there's no clathrin coat. And instead of being internalized immediately, there will be pods, like feet will appear from the cell membrane called pseudopods and will internalize and then attacked by the lysosome, destroy the bacteria or worn out cells. Like for example, RBCs. RBCs, they have short lifespan, 120 days. And then they have to be destroyed. So um, they have to be internalized into the cells, other cells like white blood cells, and have to be internalized and destroyed from there. Penocytosis is cell drinking. It is the internalization of water. So it is, there's no cell, there's, uh, there's no pseudopods. There are no receptors of protein, as you can see here. And it is just getting the water inside the cell. Okay, and uh, it's not only water, so anything outside the cell, including water and anything else, like it's bulk endocytosis. So it will go into the cell, the cell will take what it needs and then dispose the rest. So everything, that, so that's why there's no receptor. In transcytosis, the vesicle comes from one side of the cell membrane and then goes to the other side. So it's passing through the cell without affecting the cell itself. It's like a transit passenger in an airport. And so it, it internalized material, like for example, from the blood through the, this is an endothelial cell in the wall of the blood vessel to the interstitial fluid. And then the opposite to endocytosis is exocytosis. When substances are released from the cell, again, they are, we will see that in detail next time, they are going to be bundled in vesicles. And then these vesicles will attach into the cell membrane, separate the molecules from, of, that are present in the cell membrane, and will uh, let the contents of the vesicle be exocytosed to the outside. And this is what happens here, for example, between two nerve cells. This animation here, you will find many of these animations in your slideshows. If you click on them, they are part of Wiley Plus, and it will give you an animated lecture of about how the cell membrane Transport of chemicals is, uh, across the plasma function. membrane okay. is required for normal cell much. functions. Some chemicals, like oxygen, are imported to maintain metabolic processes in the cell.